Okay, I will be uh, very brief, uh, and because there's, but there are a few uh, thank yous to be said. First, to Klausen Neuberg and uh, the Abbey and everyone associated with them. What an extraordinary venue. I hope you had a wonderful time at the tours, and we want to thank them for their uh, generosity. As well as the sponsorship of the Lower Austrian government, we have a number of representatives here who have been so supportive of the concept of bringing an international group together to talk about conservation in such a beautiful uh, city and region. Uh, also, the sponsorship of the Crest Foundation, which sponsored our U.S. speakers, um, and Inca, and, and the partnership of Inca North America, uh, which we hope some of the representatives are watching them, uh, watching us in a kind of blurred state because we're streaming live uh, to a number of places around the world. We hope uh, as a kind of experiment, uh, but also to thank, uh, first of all. Uh, Gabriela Christ for all of her hard work and Maria Gruber for really just being the foundation and the cement of all that you've experienced so far. The, there's a huge cast of people we should thank, but we're not going to, we're just going to say there's this huge cast and you know who they are. Th this huge cast is kind of like putting on a Hollywood production, you know? And the Hollywood production, speaking of that, there's, there's like a billion gallons of wine sitting in this barrel behind there, so at any moment it might break out. We, um, <laughs> let me just remind you about the initiative of Dialogues for a New Century. Its purpose is to bring together a wide variety of voices to address and explore uh, challenges and concepts that are related to the contemporary world as well as to conservation and preservation of heritage. And at this point, given the theme of the Congress, we're looking at contemporary production artists, who, contemporary artists who work in the area of decorative arts and functional objects. Uh, something that is extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily important to all of us uh, but doesn't perhaps get enough discussion. And to do that, uh, we have uh, brought together six extraordinary people and to keep them talking to each other and to present leading questions, we've asked Roger Griffith, who's the uh, conservator for contemporary arts from MoMA in New York, to be the moderator of the panel. That's enough for me. Here's Roger. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. And thank you guys for coming. I have to admit, I was asked to do this very last minute, so bear with me. I, um, I didn't prepare anything, so I'm going to kind of wing it here today. Um, as Jerry said, I am a sculpture and objects conservator at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I'm one of the caretakers of the collection, and my primary responsibility is the architecture and design department at MoMA, which does house uh, approximately ten to fifteen thousand dollar uh, thousand objects that um, we're responsible for and it's a range of materials from um, very early uh, or late 19th century up to the contemporary including some of Thomas's work who you're going to hear later today so um, as Jerry said each um, each speaker we have a, a really terrific uh, lineup here for you guys we'll get six minutes I'm going to call them up one at a time and then after that we'll um, have them do some dialogue together and then we'll open it up to the floor for you guys to um, discuss this topic of decorative arts of contemporary materials. Okay. Um, the first speaker is uh, Denise Demerg, and uh, I'm going to have each one of the, the speakers just talk a little bit about themselves first, just in, to introduce themselves and about why they're here as far as uh, their background. Okay. Thank you. I'm honored to be here, thank you for having me. Um, first a disclaimer, um, I am a conservator of paintings, contemporary paintings, so I do not treat contemporary furniture. But disciplines in contemporary conservation overlap these days, and we will no doubt be puzzling out together the treatment more and more of unorthodox and uniquely challenging materials, increasingly being incorporated in the creative work of today. 
With the short time I have, I would like to show you uh, examples of what con constitutes a growing worldwide trend in contemporary design. Um, it, is, it is wildly innovative and experimental. It is design that ventures into the territory of art due to its conceptual underpinnings and modus operandi. This work is pointed, uh, makes pointed statements uh, pr uh, precisely by virtue of the choice of materials. Through the language of materials, it talks not only about form, but about politics, social conditioning, the environment, both urban and natural, about the glut of mass production and overconsumption. It is often playful and irreverent, too. It is handcrafted, sometimes painstakingly. Um, thus, the pieces are unique or of limited production. This work was, has become the highlight of the International Furniture Fair of the last decade. It is highly prized and highly collectible. But at the same time, let us not forget, it is functional. It will, be, it will be used, it will endure unknown exposure and degrees of wear and tear. Consequently, conservators of the, de of the decorative and applied arts will no doubt someday be grappling with processes of inherent vice and degradation technical malfunctions, simple breakage, and other situations uh, that have never before been encountered by you. So I had a choice of showing a few things or showing a lot of things and not saying much about them. So I chose the latter, because I think it's, um, it's important to um, see. So I'm going to let you read the captions and, I, and uh, yourselves. Um, this, this chair is made of deactivated armaments from, from Mozambique's uh, Civil War of 1975 to 1992. And these, these, these guns and things were buried by the people and then dug up after the, after the Civil War and donated to a church which disassembled them. And this artist, a designer has, in, a, in an effort to you know, cleanse the psyche, heal the psyche, uh, transformed them into design. I'm, this designer investigates the potential of a bundle of repetitive modules of primary geometry and transformed into a, by a single cut. This 2004 Lego version of the iconic red-blue chair by Garrett Rietveld is 6% bigger and comes with an aluminum frame. Rietveld intended the original for a wide public, but copyright laws prevented the Lego version from mass production. Five exist. Uh, this, this is a customized, um, well, this, this artist used uh, religious iconography, and this is a customized um, ver uh, portable church for a traveling cleric, he says. Uh, this, this Mississippi mud chair is a homage to Mississippi's farmers, also to Mississippi's, the state, the soil, the variety of culture, its history, cultural roots, seldom seen from outside the state. This garbage was found in a two-block two radius around the artist's studio. It strives both to be compelling and repelling. <laughs> this designer did a lot of work uh, researching various springs to find the, the you know, perfect seating comfort and uh, crocheted the 
the seat. This, this artist built a mold in which straws were placed. He used up, to two, uh, used two, up two sides. No, he, he warmed up two sides with uh, heated metal sheets, which melted and, and fused the straws together. This, this artist, just for your information, was a senior art director for Disney's global network of theme parks. And um, he's really into an accumulation. <laughs> 35,000 wells, two months to make, 22 in existence. This uh, chair has no frame, it's frameless. Sought for the, their latent potential, the ready-made banal objects, the man-made landscape, are upcycled by either enhancing their inherent qualities or by radically counter-programming their use. That's, an art, that's the artist's statement. Flip-flops. Price bundles plastic products uh, and then uses a heated seat-shaped metal and to form the seat. Um, use materi poor materials to make things out of. Um, makes bourgeois archetypes that express the decline, but in the spirit of the cabinet of curiosity. <laughs> Yes, these are candy gummy bears. This is actual tampons. Um, <laughs> more about this artist later. This is bread. This artist calls this uh, range other people's rubbish. It was intended as a possible form of future uplifting. Am I getting close? I'll just speed through. Those, all those little, the clasp tells time, two hairs tell time. And that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Denise. So that's a lot of images to sort of uh, store in your brain, but keep them in your mind as we um, continue here. Um, a lot of materials, a lot of ephemeral materials. I'm just going to sort of recap really quickly, and a lot of um, assemblage, found materials. So we'll we'll get we'll talk about more about that um, as after the speaker, the other speakers. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ginger Dunnigan, uh, and so Ginger, please, could you come forward? Hello. I'm an independent curator and one of the partners in a firm called Curator Squared, and we look specifically at the intersection of art and design in our exhibitions. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, ephemeral design taken to the next level where it could even be disposable or um, you know, just out of fashion very quickly. The rate at which we as a society consume and discard is incredibly fast and growing faster. Because art is a direct reflection of society, it follows that we would see the same themes in the fine arts as well as the applied and functioning arts and design. Whether we see it as a critique or objective comment on the phenomenon or manifest in the materials and formal qualities of the design, it is undoubtedly present and results in work that is increasingly impermanent. The issue of impermanence has long been part of performance art, installation art, and land art, for example. 
but is now everywhere in the world of applied arts as well. Conservators must revisit standard practices and techniques to accommodate this shift, making rapid fire adjustments to meet the technological advances and material experimentation. One suggestion might be that we take our cue from the world of fashion when considering where to go from here. As a case study of sorts, I would like to look to an exhibition that my partner and I curated for the Design Museum Holon in Israel called Mechanical Couture. Within this one grouping of fashion and objects, there were 40 garments ranging from super organza to the humble t-shirt, 12 shoes designed in response to an interactive computerized questionnaire, working machines and 3D printers, an installation comprised of anything from toy pianos to soldering irons. Because of the range of materials, literally from steel to repurposed audio cassette tape, it's rich for discussion about conservation. It's always been tricky or challenging to deal with the conservation of fashion. Something meant to be ephemeral or out of fashion quickly needs to stand the test of time. Now more than ever, the range of materials and new technologies is making it even more of a challenge. One of the designers in our exhibition, Ying Gao, is known for her interactive approach to fashion design. Something that could easily be considered a conceptual design becomes in her hands a fashion reality. Delicate origami-like folds of super organza and medical grade metallic gauze literally expand and contract when light is shined on them. Others respond to breath or even the presence of cameras. Not only would materials themselves be difficult to conserve and preserve, but the functional and supporting apparatus must also be taken into consideration. Now conservation includes an IT specialist, not to mention someone to manage the um, air compressor that's part of the work. Shelley Fox, on the other hand, turns to vintage garments as a starting point. Using fat maps, typically for medical purposes, she renders the layers of fat within the dresses through the accumulation of fabrics to create a visual representation of fat loss by volunteers participating in a supervised weight loss regimen. Here, the fat map x-rays, vintage reworked garments, and the documentation are all part of the work to be conserved. While the textiles alone might not pose a significant problem, maintaining the integrity of a work that has been reworked to integrate fabrics from var various periods and other elements might. It also brings up a point about documentation in the object record. The fat maps, integral to the understanding of the collection, and in many ways communicating more about the work than the garments, must also become part of the piece to be conserved. This incredible installation was the result of a collaboration between Issei Miyake and James Dyson. The robot-like mannequins are as much a part of the work as the garments. These pants obviously cannot be placed in a simple archival box with tissue. So this work also brings up issues of artist rights and conservation. Issei Miyake in particular is extremely particular about the storage, display, and documentation. So those records also become a part of this piece. So it's a great example of a piece that is not a self-contained package with the garment alone communicating information but the entirety of the installation becomes the work. This, this leads us to Marlos Ten Bomer and her experimentation with the mechanics and engineering of shoe design. Her installation comprised a working rotational molding machine, which she designed, the various embodiments of the shoe in the testing stages, the molds and the end result among countless other objects. Her other work involved a 3D printing technology that has become so prevalent in the design industry. The technology is arguably as much a part of the final product as the resin or plastic it is made from, and all must be taken into consideration. And in the same way that conserving new media needs to account for the transmission of technology, so too would conserving this installation. Alice Santoro's sonic fabric is made from discarded audio cassette tape that has been woven into fabric that can actually be worn and played by a vintage Walkman. Of course, the Walkman becomes part of the work as if the audio cassette tape wouldn't pose enough of a challenge. New techniques have to be developed to conserve new materials. If conservators are meant to be caretakers of, sort, of sorts, preserving our cultural heritage, that needs to embody culture in its entirety, including the somewhat ephemeral or even disposable objects of art and design. What these objects communicate about us through the material choices and or content that we are living in a fast-paced time of rapid change is a significant bit of information to communicate. In fashion, takes on multiple meanings for us today. Fashion with a capital F is one thing to conserve and preserve, but the continual disposal and consumption of more fashionable design objects over older objects leads us in a direction that requires a refashioning of our methodologies on behalf of curators, conservators, and countless other professionals in our field. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ginger, for that really interesting talk. Um, 
It's interesting because she talked a lot about how um, we as conservators have to change and look at, uh, and maybe the, a new methodology has to be um, incorporated into the way we think about objects that come into collections. And that's something that I'd like you guys to remember about from Ginger's talk, so we can talk a little bit more about that and our role as a conservator and how that keeps changing. And it's a really nice sort of uh, segue into Thomas, Thomas Libertini, who is our next speaker. Um, and I'll let Thomas introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you. Six minutes. My name is Tomasz Libertini and I studied industrial design, painting and sculpture. And now I do something that's in between all three. Um, I'm going to show you first three images uh, that are relevant to the subjects of my work and, uh, and then I'm going to show you the, the things that I do that are relevant to the discussion of um, conservation of uh, contemporary art. Um, this is sort of one of the ways I look at uh, challenges that I have in my work and that is uh, some kind of a hidden relationship uh, in materials and uh, the inner workings of, uh, of phenomena. And usually uh, they are natural phenomena. Um, and this is what I think is for me uh, a design. There is um, uh, many ways of how to define design in uh, contemporary um, discussion what is art and what is design, but generally I see it as a system by which elements are put together uh, into coherent uh, whole. And this is another um, image that uh, goes in line with the same thought. And I, the reason why I choose Arnold Schwarzenegger is because uh, this is for me the, the symbol of design. It is understanding a natural process and understanding it to its very limits so that you can manipulate it and achieve uh, very good results, uh, results that are seemingly impossible but uh, are more or less unique. And uh, here are examples of my work. Um, I, I started uh, working with beeswax because it was sort of a natural choice for me to counter act uh, the, the currents uh, that were in uh, industrial design and I made uh, several objects uh, with it. Uh, I started with the vases because uh, for me the, the relationship between wax and vase was a very beautiful loop between the bees uh, and the flowers and the vases and uh, trying to work with the sort of the tragedy of the material that is very sensitive, sensitive to light, sensitive to temperature and sensitive to pressure and all these things uh, render it very useless. Um, then I made uh, a larger object, um, larger amphora. This is completely made out of beeswax, uh, seven different types um, that created uh, beautiful textures and colorations, uh, but nonetheless rendered uh, the object um, um, sort of uh, how do you say, not, not feminine, but uh, very vulnerable. And um, what I found out later is that uh, beeswax is one of the more, more durable materials in the, uh, in the whole kind of what are natural materials, wood, and et cetera, paper. And it's a sort of the contradiction that it carries that I like. Um, so I started to investigate um, the options that I had. How, how far can I push uh, working with beeswax? Because a lot has been done in pr previous. And um, I, I started making research uh, with beekeepers. And uh, I found a way how to manipulate nature to the extent that I can force uh, honeybees to create uh, objects that uh, resemble artifacts of uh, human artifacts. And in this case, this is a vase that is uh, completely made by bees. And um, it, it speaks a lot about repetition, industrial production, and it also takes away the role of a maker uh, from this equation and puts uh, the designer, the artist, in a position uh, where he understands the process completely and is able to tweak it, to manipulate it, to control it and achieve results. And that goes back to the Arnold Schwarzenegger picture um, where, where these things connect. Uh, this is another piece that I did uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it's a figure 
uh, skin of which is completely made by bees. This is me uh, with the with the brush, and uh, we used quite advanced techniques uh, to accomplish accomplish this installation. There's a lot of different materials. There is uh, the figure that is actually rapid prototyped uh, from SLS um, through SLS machines and the bees built over this. Uh, so there is sort of the computer generated image, uh, rapid prototyping, manipulation of nature, and sort of combination of these uh, all together in one installation. Uh, here is an example uh, of another sculpture that I did also with bees. Um, this was done in Venice with uh, Venice glass blowers. The, the core uh, of this seed, the, the title of the work is uh, The Seed of Narcissus. Um, is a glass. So it's a hollow glass that is um, that has a silver on the inside. So it serves as a mirror of the space, and the bees built the skin completely over it, so that individual honeycombs become little tiny mirrors. Um, so it becomes like a many mirror object. Um, but it was a beautiful combination for me of two fragile materials in one. It was, a, it was a strange kind of vibration between these two. So it has to be handled with care. And um, this, is, uh, this is an object uh, made out of paper. This is the, uh, the table. Um, but I was more or less interested in uh, the surface quality and uh, the relationship between wood paper, writing, and the whole aspect of uh, six minutes. Um, the whole aspect of, um, you know, t being careful about objects. Uh, I like when a, when a user takes distance and, and treats objects with certain kind of a care. And um, the, the surface of the table is made out of 22,000 strips of newspaper paper. And they are aligned vertically. So you can open it as a book, but they are so tight it's almost invisible by a naked eye to see it, but if I press it really hard, you see that the slice opens. Uh, so it's almost as if it's a super large book. But the surface has a very strange and almost a new type of quality, of tactile quality of a surface where it, uh, it's like a fabric, but it's not a fabric. Um, and it brings sort of the, the new experience in terms of materials. Um, here's an object that I also made with paper. We glued hundreds uh, of, of strips of paper that were pre-printed. An individual print contained an image of a tree, uh, which you can see uh, as a sort of uh, a ghost image on the side of this vase. But uh, this is an installation in a museum together with uh, a video of the making of it. And each vase contained the same image through and through. So that means everywhere you cut, it was made in a block, a square block. And uh, the wood uh, turner got this block and it shaped it into these uh, vases. But uh, no matter what you change, the, the image still appeared and it was always different. It was just dependent on the shape. But I like that it wasn't the surface quality, it was the, the material quality and the image was inside the material or inside the object. And this is the last project, and uh, it's sort of like um, a nice behind the scenes uh, that I'm going to run you through. Uh, we made a large fresco type of mirror uh, where I used plaster to, uh, to achieve uh, a beautiful new visual effect. Uh, this is a, a large 4 by 3 meter sheet of glass. Uh, we were commissioned this work in Basel a couple of years ago, and uh, we poured uh, very um, fine uh, plaster on top of this glass sheet. And we had this whole thing lifted up straight. Uh, it was quite an adventure, but I've never seen the surface quality like this before. This, this monolithic, gigantic, super flat, uh, mirror-like whiteness. Um, and we had this later um, covered with Indian ink. Uh, it was painted with Indian ink and then we used carnauba wax uh, to polish it and we achieved a very strange result which was almost as a Polaroid camera where objects that were really close to the surface appeared very clear and sharp and the further you went the, the illusion of the reflection blurred. 
And I found it sort of very poetic, strange um, way of trying to make a mirror from a very vulnerable material uh, such as plaster and, and natural things like Indian ink and carnauba wax. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. I think, I think what we can take away from that is, the, again, the ephemeral materials, but also a, a statement that he said, tragedy of materials. So keep that in mind. I'd like to come back to that. So our next speaker, which I forgot to bring with me. Who was it? Who's our next one? Are you next, Frederica? Frederica Von Tag is next. OK. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah. Um, just want to introduce myself a short time, and then uh, we go to the directly to the materials and to conservation, because you now you saw a lot of materials, object, and so on. So I'm uh, coming from the University of Applied Science Cologne, the Conservation Institute of Conservation Science. Originally, I was trained as a cabinet maker before I studied conservation and preservation and monuments care. Working in different museums and then coming back at the university being a teacher and researcher in the wooden artifacts and modern materials. And uh, we had a diploma program and now we have a bachelor and master program and just to tell you, in Germany we have, before you can enter the university, one year of practical studies before. So you have to know what kind of conservation specialization do you want to study. And we uh, offer uh, modern materials and modern and contemporary art in the conservation program. Um, mostly original works and we try to do it in the bachelor, 50% practical work and in the master it's 70% of practical work. And what is the practical work we are doing in the Institute? It's not only on cleaning. As conservators, you know, we are doing a lot of cleaning. And here you see the students cleaning the room. It's also that sometimes you don't clean, all, uh, you only, cl you, sorry. You not only clean the objects, you also clean the rooms. But um, as you have seen so many objects and so many materials and uh, the people who know me, they know I love plastics and I want to talk about a little bit on plastics. And here you see a chair by Oskar Hodosi, originally an Austrian designer who stopped designing objects. But this is a chair from 90, the 19, late 1960s and it's made of polyurethane hard foam and polyurethane soft foam and it's... Uh, we have a mouse here, yeah. It's broken in here, and it's a private object. And we will talk about museum objects and private objects, but this is a private object, and the owner came to us and said, this is my most loved object, and I want to sit on it. And I thought about, oh my God, this won't work. And this is something you often think about when you're thinking about modern materials. What we do we thought about, okay, we try it, we take the challenge, and we thought about, we can't solve this problem alone, and conservation is also about teamwork. It's not only working together with the designer, uh, uh, it's also working together with the industry, with the plastics engineer, and here we have been working together with the plastics engineer, because coming my background from wood and plastics, I thought about, okay, gluing and put some uh, armation in there, and uh, working with the plastics, engineer, he said, no, just thought about the pressure you have and then try to put some more material in. And this is, uh, where's the mouse? Uh, thinking about taking them some um, carbon fiber sheets uh, and aramid fiber sheets beneath it and glue it and dry it and tr just try it. And um, we had an engineer calculating the weight because the owner weights 19 kilos, and remember, he wants to sit on it. So we said, okay, we try. 
we, had, we hadn't had any dummy materials. We asked the buyer company who produced the material and said, oh, just bring over the chair, we make a new one. We said, no, we, know, we don't make, want a new one, we want to keep the old one. And we tried it and we put it, glued it together with polyurethane foam and all the sheets. Here you see the process at the end and it worked. It is now five years ago and the owner told me it's still working. He's not sitting on it every day, but sometimes, and it keeps his 90 kilos. Another problem with plastics is, um, I, I think every one of you know the Pantone chair. And the Pantone chair was produced in different plastics materials. Plastic is not plastic. Every plastic material is different. And with every different material, we have to produce a different form. And this you can see here, up here you see the Pantone chair, and here you see the different materials. With, with the first one, the, um, the polyester glass fiber, uh, you need really thick walls. Um, it's getting thicker if you're using polyurethane foam, and it's getting thinner if you're, if you're using the, um, the ASA. And it's changing then if, you, if you're using the PP, the, Sorry, the polypropylene. So when we thinking about conservation of plastics or modern materials, we have to think about the material, we have to think about the function, and we have to think about the production technology, how the work, the chair is produced. What do you need for it? What ingredients is going into the material? And what is the machinery who is producing it? Then you can start to think about how we can uh, do the conservation work. At the moment we have a project on the um, Panton chair about gluing the ASA material and uh, we tried to, to find a solution to glue the ASA material so that some, someone can sit on it. We know we can do it for the museum so you can see it but you can't sit on it. And here working together Again, with the, with the industry and the plastics engineer, we tried to find uh, glue. We didn't find one yet, I can tell you. It's still, the research has to go on. But it's really going deep into the material. And um, understanding the material, understanding the aging mechanisms, um, to, to try to find solutions and just to take the risk to do the conservation work. So just what I want to put in the, dis in the discussion is think about the materials and take the risk to do the conservation work. Um, this is just the last example. It's a um, telephone uh, cell, you see? telephone box, telephone cell um, from a city hall in, in Stuttgart. It was um, designed for secret phone calls for the, uh, for the um, people working in the city hall. And it's also made of modern materials, it's plywood, and here you see just progress and working. So take the risk, don't be afraid, touch it, don't worry about it. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Frederica. Um, so risks and material choice. Um, I think that's really interesting, and I think Thomas touched on that as well, about the limits of materials. And this is something that's really similar. They sort of dovetail together. And I know as a conservator of contemporary modern materials, we, um, we tend to have to make um, choices and decisions about how we treat an object and take that risk. So I do want to come back to that. Um, our next speaker is Tim Bechtold um, from the Dinoya Sam Long. So I'll let Tim introduce himself. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Roger. Um, my name is Tim Bechtold. I'm from the Neue Sammlung, the International Design Museum uh, in Munich. Um, the Neue Sammlung, the International Design Museum, which houses the world's largest and most important collection of industrial design. The large number of objects, which is around 80,000, reflects the technologies and materials developed in the course of the 20th century, attesting in particular to the use of plastics. However, unlike most traditional materials, these are subject to, a di to dynamic aging processes. 
and after only a short time often already bear irreversible traces of degradation. Corresponding types of damage can hardly be reconciled with the respective designer's original intention and are often problematic in, time, in terms of conservation. When moving to the Pinacothek of Modern in 2002, the conservation department was founded. Since that time, there's a strong focus on the conservation of degraded modern materials. Through the research into the deterioration and preservation of the collections, the development of new conservation processes, and the knowledge of original technology, our department has become an important center for the conservation of design. If you focus on the conservation of modern materials, the basic, basic necessity of networking is evident. With the internationally renowned Biennale Conference Future Talks, we succeeded in establishing a groundbreaking international platform to discuss and exchange experience in the conservation of modern materials. To illustrate the huge range of challenges in conserving applied art objects from the 20th and 21st century, I'd like to highlight four representative examples. Many of our conservation projects are somehow related to plastic materials, which proved to be far less stable as expected at the time they were applied by the designers. First, I start with the S-chair, um, a prototype made of powder-coated banded and wheel steel tubes designed by Tom Dixon in 1987, which showed heavy signs of deterioration already 13 years after production. The cover is made of very thin latex rubber, and within a few years it became brittle and sticky. The evolution of tears led to heavy deformations and the urgent need of conservation treatment. The only possibility to prolong the lifespan of the degraded rubber cover was to exclude the negative influences like oxygen, light, and ozone. The treatment included not only consolidation and special storage of the original cover, but also reconstruction with pattern. In 1965, Futuro, an UFO-shaped house, was designed by the Finnish architect Matti Suoronen. The outer shell comprises a sandwich construction of glass fiber reinforced polyester filled with poly polyester polyurethane hard foam. Due to nearly 50 years of weathering, the outer shell of the house was in a very poor condition. Regarding the design historical importance of the Futuro house and its complexity in synthetic materials, different aspects were projected. Documentation of condition, material, and technology, analysis and influence of microorganisms, and virtual documentation and display by means of three-dimensional laser scan technology. If we think about prototypes, we can state that in most cases they aren't meant to last. Basically, they have to illustrate a certain state of the designer's idea in three dimensions just for a certain time. Most of all, the car industry relies on them. An important part of the car design process is still the so-called tape drawing. By means of very thin and elastic self-adhesive tape, a two-dimensional draft is attached to the wall. Basically, these drafts are temporary. In our last exhibition on Mercedes-Benz, we had two of them. The challenge was to transfer this tape drawing from the exhibition wall to a portable carrier to conserve it. Inspired by the Italian technique called Strapo, we developed a suitable method. Related to prototyping, I also like to mention a rather new technology called rapid prototyping, RP, that became available in the late 1980s. Rapid prototyping plays an important role in the designing process to realize complex shapes. Since the beginning of the new millennium, some of these products have attained cult status. Produced as limited editions, they were sold like art objects. No wonder that in the meantime, the first RP objects have already entered museum collections. If we consult the RP producing industry, we can state a high degree of enthusiasm with a huge amount of remaining questions. There's just a few information related to material degradation and failure. Here you can see uh, RP piece of our, our collection, the famous chair Solid C2, designed by Patrick Juin in 2004. For the chair Solid C2, Juin opted for the RP Technic stereolithography. Due to its distinct tendency to, to yellow, the chair was realized in lacquered epoxy resin. Solid C2 is a limited edition of 30 pieces, which are sold each around 35,000 euro. To avoid further failure, we, we, we do a regular monitoring on this object. By sh conclusion, by showing you these examples, I hope you got an idea of some challenges in the conservation of modern applied art. Most of our collectibles are objects of daily use. When entering the collection, they show traces of use, are damaged of the synthetic, or the synthetic material is significantly uh, degraded. A dramatically change in appearance is quite often a result of irreversible chemical reactions in the material which blurs the original intention of the designer. 
what is acceptable. For us, this is mostly the basis for discussions and uh, the aspect to start our discussions to define a suitable conservation treatment. Last but not least, let me summarize our top 11 uh, when it comes to conserving modern applied art. First, document your object as comprehensive as possible. Try to avoid exclusively digital documentations. Second, carry out regular monitoring on sensitive objects. Third, when it comes to objects that include design parts which are not visible while, while out of function, user faces for iPads, iPods, uh, iPhones, always collect further information on your collectible. Consult the designer, but don't trust his conservation concept. Initiate scientific research project, most of all on topics which are fast moving. To avoid drastic conservation treatments, reconstruction is always a possibility, but it's not the original. Stay cool if it comes to death of an object. Remember, collectibles which were mass produced are sometimes hard to find, and even they are all, uh, often made of cheap materials. Create platforms to advise artists, designers on material behavior, testing of materials, degradation tests. Share information, this is one of the most important points in, in our field. Um, share technological findings and conservation treatments with other collections or uh, collectors. And int intensify your professional network. Um, visit conferences like here or come next year to the Future Talks in Munich for the next series or by the catalog which is uh, at the bookstore here at the conference desk, um, the Future Talk. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Tim. I think Tim touched on something also that I'd like to bring up when we have the discussion, and that is about an object that dies, something that is no longer exhibitable, which is a term that we use at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, our last speaker is Carl Agner, who's the director of the State Museum of Lower Austria. And Carl, it's an honor to have you here. Please. Dear chairman, colleagues and guests, there is a song when Hollywood die, I remember right? Not only the object dies. <laughs> Allow me to begin with a quote. It all fell to pieces, the pieces to more pieces, and this to even more pieces. The words decomposed in my mouth like moldy mushrooms. In this way, 100 years ago, the Austrian writer Hugo von Hofmannsthal, co-founder of the Salzburger Festspiele and author of the world-famous theater piece Every Man, described in this prose text, the letter of Lord Chandos, the failing apart of the relationship between language and world. In the light of the well-known fact that no other generation of artists, more so than the generation of the 20s and beginning of the 21st century, have had access to such an abundance of every newly development, material and immaterial. It is not absurd to draw analogy to the words of Hoffmannsthal. Words which speak of a world which disintegrates into every new material, and this material in turn crumbles into new material and immaterial. This has become a Herculean challenge, not only from the perspective of conservation and restoration, but also in terms of curatorial and museological requirements of a collection. In the following, I would like to speak about some aspects regarding the areas of the, of the tension between artist and museological needs and requirements, which these developments have brought about. In the 1960s, the term expanded art established itself increasingly. However, 
in the general at the latest since the 19th century with the industrialization of European society and also in consideration of the resulting newly created materials, be it the photography or electricity, can we speak of a permanent societal expansion process? At the latest with Marcel Duchamp's journal was the border between art and everyday life abolished. The travel every day on one side and on the other side, the exclusive artistic became obsolete, as we vividly see in the Italian Arte Bovara movement. There were no more material taboos. On the contrary, in the areas of decorative and applied arts, the new materials quickly become important elements of the artistic's repertoire. We must not overlook to the fact that it was and is always the artists themselves who have and still to participate in the creation of new materials. We have only to think about the invention of photography, which represented the creation of a completely new form of picture material or on the world of the digital pictures in the development of which many artists also at Message Institute of Technology participated and still do participate. In the area of fine art, as well as in the area of decorative and applied art, the semantic properties of the new material played an important role in the motivation to use them. It is in the semantic properties about all in the functional aspect that the material is easily formed and lightweight, which brings variety to the forefront, as in the area of fine art, it is mainly the aesthetic effect. Aluminium is an instructive paradigmatic example. In the 1825, experimentally isolated, the industrial reproduction began in the middle of the 19th century. It was first noted as a luxury article at the Paris World Exhibition. Monica Wagner, in her informative study titled The Materials of Art, described it as a jewelry metal. It quickly became an important industrial factor about all because of its ease of handling and its extremely lightweight. At first, in connection with constructivism, it became more and more frequently used as a fine art material, in part because of its outstanding properties of light reflection on its surface, as well as the possibility for combination with another materials for example, as aluminum color. It became a constant material factor in the art of the last 80 years, from Tatlin to Pollock, from Chart to the Austrian, for example, artist Hans Kuppelwieser. Its allergen plasticity is another important aspect of its usability above all in the era of object art. And its material semantic as with stainless steel has per se become a statement and a synonym for the modern and modernity. Silver iodide, silver chloride, and silver bromide, as well as quicksilver vapor for development and silent solution as fixative are the ingredients and basis of photography. With this entirely new picture material also came new museological conservation and curation demands. With the development in the 1870s of plastic celluloid, a completely new support material for the photochemical substance was created. Because of its elasticity and transparency, it was until the invention of the digital electronic picture, the ideal analog photofilm material. It is also a remarkable example 
of how in the area of fine art between the First and Second World War and after 1945, a material could be transformed from a carrier medium into an object. I would direct you to the work of the Austrian avant-garde filmer artist Peter Kobelka. In the end of the 60s, he was very well known in New York. Basic experimental attitudes in the area of applied art, as well as fine arts, are the scene of innovative and intensive handling of ever more new materials. The fact that from the perspective above all in fine arts, the conversation aspect has often not only been neglected, but also ignored in, as we know, painfully clear. The argument for more durability and sustainability as part of the artist material consciousness leads quickly, leads quickly to a rigorous counter-argument of the limitation of artists' freedom. But how can a consciousness for the durability of material be demanded when apparently there is an implicit inner correlation between the acceleration demand of society for disposable products and the resulting short life of these products? Not to speak of an art form such as performance art, which per se allows only documentation and this allows preservation of the real time even in a museum. So we have the situation more and more. The one side, the demands, the wishes and the dreams of the artists, also designers. Of the other side, the responsibility for our collections and for a long, long future for this collection. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for that talk. Um, so I'll, with the speakers, I'll come up back up to the table. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little bit of a dialogue with the, the speakers. I, w I want them to sort of have a dialogue together. We're going to open it up to the floor as well. Um, we are on a live feed. We are going to be uh, taking some questions from online as well. So. Um, just be aware of that as well. So thank you again for um, all of your prepared talks. Um, I think where, where I'd like to begin is um, talking about materials. Um, and since this, this is, um, is this working? Should I, it, that's working. Um, since this, the word material has been used over and over and over amongst all the, the uh, panel, I think this is a, a good departure point for us. Uh, we can talk about uh, materiality, choice of materials, and since we're all coming from different backgrounds uh, of, of in the field, I think this idea of choice is a really good way to start uh, uh, by, the, by the artist choosing a material to make his art, by the um, curator choosing to collect that art or that collector or that museum, and then by the um, choice as a conservator, how we store and exhibit, or the, the, the curator, and then again, how we choose as conservators to conserve that object. So um, I'm gonna open it up, and if anybody here on the panel wants to start with that, um, please. No? Oh, yes. Can we switch off the projector? Please. Ginger, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just start calling on people. Um, so um, I know in your talk you, you did mention um, uh, the idea of uh, ephemeral materials, the, um, the magnetic tape, for instance, and the choice of this artist using this magnetic tape. And I think sometimes with artists, um, you know, you don't want to interfere with them and, 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 and their choice of materials. And I'm just wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about that from your knowledge or, or of this exhibition that you um, right. curated. Okay. I mean, in so many cases, that's the that unusual choice of materials and the experimentation that draws you to the work to begin with. So um, that's that's a big part of what we went to, what we, look, what we were looking for for that exhibition, which was all about a new type of couture that was um, incredibly customized and, and um, 
worked on for the individual, but using mechanical processes. So obviously a lot of the materials were very unusual. Um, but I was also wanted to mention too, I was struck by, I went to the Mac Center um, and saw the exhibition on display there and so much of the, the pieces on display now are prototypes, um, are the works, oh, I'm sorry, That's okay. are the works leading up to the finished product and with the kind of rapid movement of the next design and the next um, iteration of the design, those prototypes are now meant to be collected with the final object too. So now we've got more and more objects and more and more materials that uh, go along with just that one piece. Anybody want to, anybody here want to sort of comment from Ginger's? Anyone? Denise? Well, I, I know, I'm, I work on contemporary paintings, and, and obviously I'm very interested in the, the, the use of any material, I mean, odd and unusual materials in, in design, but I, I think that there's, there's uh, an interesting dilemma, I mean, the, these, the artists used already de deteriorated materials, materials that are bound to deteriorate. Um, but are we, are we to stop them? They're making a statement about that very thing, you know? And, um, and who, who, you know, who was it that said, oh, you, you know, just say goodbye to, to dead objects, you know? <laughs> I think we're probably going to be seeing a little bit more of that in the, in the future. But, um, you know, maybe we'll develop ways to, preserve some of these, you know, plastics and other materials. But I, I really, I'm, I'm, I sort of, you know, wonder if it's uh, a, a good idea to sort of curtail creativity by, um, you know, I and mean, we call attention to the, to the fact of, of the vulnerability of the materials, but, but to curtail uh, that sort of thing, I don't know if it's our role, unfortunately. I would like to um, ask Thomas, uh, since he is an artist and does work with materials, and I think you uh, brought this up that you wanted to uh, push the limits of ma materials or the process, maybe, I think that's what you said. Uh, and the choice of using beeswax, and you said it was a material that was quite stable. Um, but then there is this idea of um, working in, in, uh, with objects or creating design objects and or art, and I think another thing you said that was interesting was what is art and what is design, and how do we, as professionals, you know, treat these objects? And I think that's very important as well because I think um, in the museum I work in a, a lab that's an objects lab, and we're treating both objects, and we do try to treat them the same. But I'm just wondering, you know, it's, you're also using a combination of materials, and sometimes we find as conservators that's where the problem really stems from, is where you've got this combination of materials. It's not maybe just the beeswax, it might be the combination. And I'm just wondering if you think about that or do you consider that when you're choosing materials. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> is this working? Yeah. And um, I'm glad you asked because um, it was a couple of months ago, uh, and another, I, I didn't show it, uh, but I made a re really large vessel made out of, uh, made by bees, and uh, it's, it's in a glass vitrine, it's in a glass box, and um, it's, it's uh, invisibly mounted to the glass, and uh, when the museum purchased it, um, I was very fond of that approach, that they wanted to know every detail about what screws, how it's made, what's the glass, how, what glass is it? And uh, luckily I keep all the information to the hand, so we could, well, I could have given it, but uh, I was surprised that they wanted to know what type of glue, and not only what type of glue, you can say two-component epoxy, but what kind of two-component epoxy did you use? And um, I find it very relevant because I'm, I'm a fanatic myself, uh, but uh, sometimes I like, to, like that, that uh, people who buy it um, actually care about it as well. But um, um, I just had this thought when, when Denise uh, said something um, about conservation. And uh, gen generally when I watch the, uh, the presentations that uh, there is this uh, need to restore uh, objects um, to their maybe their, 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 their former uh, visual as they were. And it was, a, it was a couple, it was a year ago that I went to the Greece, to the Acropolis. And uh, it's, it's, it's in a terrible shape uh, still after, I don't know, they've been working on it for 60, 70 years. And uh, it's still a ruin. 
and uh, whether, whether it's an idea to, <laughs> to restore it to the former glory or when you have a broken chair, just fix it as a broken piece. So when it's used, just conserve it in, instead of restore it because there is no intention to restore Acropolis to its former shape, just to kind of freeze it in a moment. And um, the, the reason why I work with wax wasn't because uh, I wanted to make durable objects. Uh, I, just, I just found it very intellectually appealing to, uh, to work with the material that is seemingly out of the context of industrial design, uh, though it's, it's part of almost a lot of the objects. I mean, cosmetics, food, uh, furniture as well. And uh, I found out that it's one of the most durable things out there. I mean, they found it in Pharaoh tombs, completely intact, full with honey, uh, possible to eat it. And um, with the thing with the bees uh, and the objects with the bees is that uh, as, as, as fragile as they look, um, they, if you keep them in the conditions that uh, are uh, suited for it, it will last thousands of years. And uh, the fact that it was meant for sort of intellectual use, a visual use, um, only renders it, uh, you know, timeless in a sense. Uh, so I kept keep that in mind, but of course, I mean, we're not working for a fashion brand, uh, in a French fashion brand. And it's a completely different approach. I can't use beeswax uh, for mass, in the, uh, mass production. So you choose according to the context. I also think you, know, you touched on something that uh, Tim brought up, which was this idea of uh, sharing information. And, um, and I think that's a really important part of our profession as well, about um, sharing profession, but also artist interviews. We have an artist interview program at MoMA where we, um, once we acquire an object, probably from this that happened to you as well, was it a conservator that asked you these questions? Or yes, was yes, yeah. So, you know, where we want to know as much information about the process of how the object was made, so that we keep that in our files for future if we find any kind of changes that happen with the object. And I think that we've been very successful with that. But, you know, um, then there are some artists that, you know, don't want to give that information. Uh, I think with design uh, uh, designers, sometimes they might have a secret that they don't want to necessarily share. Uh, we haven't really found that to be so true, but I mean, we have with uh, more, more contemporary artists. But again, it's this issue of both, they're both the same in a way. We're talking about art, I guess, here. So um, does anybody want in, in the panel want have a question that they're dying to ask or to a comment? Frederica? Yeah, um, I would like to comment on it because uh, what Thomas said about the Acropolis is quite interesting. Like you're working as a designer or artist or in between, that uh, it depends on the project you're working on. I think it's the same with conservation, that we have a, a wide range of uh, possibilities to conserve, to preserve the work. And um, also like the Acropolis, we can have a design object which we conserve or preserve as a ruin, of course. Or we have to say, like, like, like Tim said, that sometimes we have objects we can't preserve and you won't understand it without preserving. So we have to say, okay, this object is dead. We have, but we have the documentation, how it's done, how, what the artist or the designer was thinking about it, what he wanted to do it. And on the other hand, sometimes we have uh, projects where we really do restoration work, not only on the visual aspect, but only on the functional aspect, they can really can use the object again. So the, the range working on the conservation of uh, design object or decorative art objects, I think is, is as big as you working as a designer. And it's also um, the discussion starts at each object at a new point. So it's it's like each object has its own dis discussion, and um, so it's it's like everywhere in the conservation right. world. It's yeah. it's there was a, the the affinity to conserve design objects like they they were meant at their time they were produced. But uh, fortunately, from from my point of view, that has changed, and we we accept traces of use and. Um, we accept uh, the, the original um, old lacquer or something like this. Um, but, but at each object we, we have to discuss, we have to make a new discussion about this. Um, what happened to the Tom Dixon chair? <laughs> to the Tom Dixon chair? I, yeah. I would have just said, this is dead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
First, first we had to, to consolidate because it was really flaking and, and the danger of, of losing material uh, grew and grew more and more. And then I wrote uh, to Tom and, and he was very nice and he, he wrote back and he said, oh, I like your, your, your version with the, all these stripes on it and that looks great. But, but for us as a design museum, that wasn't very, we don't feel happy with this. And also we decided we, we can't show it like a rune. No, we, we, we can, but we, on the other hand, we want to have the, the, the origin or the, the object like it was meant to be. So we decided to, to store the original material like it was a ruin, but we, we stored it in a um, laminated foil without oxygen and without light. And uh, we make a reconstruction by pattern, with pattern. Um, and covered the, the, the old steel tubes with a new cover. Um, it was the same thing like, like Tom Dixon did uh, in the 80s. And we, we had it on presentation, both on one side, the second was a, was a, was a ruin, with a dead body of, of the cover and uh, beneath the, the reconstruction of the cover. So, and we, we had a, a text explaining what happened and uh, what was the treatment. So for, for me, this was a good version um, because th th there wasn't any other possibility. Yeah. I haven't seen, an, I just, just want to add, this is a crazy yeah. idea, of course. Uh, I haven't seen an industrial object or, let's say, an object of use uh, that was, let's say, updated into its contemporary use of material, such as architecture is, because you see architecture as, you know, it has a medieval yeah. ground plan, then there was a renaissance uh, addition to it, and then and, and, and it just grows and grows. You don't have that with industrial objects, that they are made in a certain t period, and there is no layering. There's something beautiful about conserving, um, let's say, art architecture, where it lasts for hundreds of years, and you can, see through layers of professional editions or let's say unprofessional editions as well. And uh, you don't have that with, with industrial design. You don't have that with, with chairs. You don't have that with, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very short lived, very time specific. So. Sometimes, I think sometimes, sometimes you have this um, living with an object over years and years, uh, you will change it. Yeah, with, especially with chairs, chairs or tables, uh, you change the surface, you change, I don't know, the drawers or whatever, so you can see on every uh, time, the certain time, you can, you can read on the object, yeah. Well, a Penton chair is a good example, maybe, but you don't see it because... Yeah, you, yeah it won't last so long. <laughs> this is a problem. But uh, especially with, with objects made of wood or with technical objects, People are changing and living with it, and, and they will change it like they, they want it. And it's not as much as with architecture, but in some kind, they change it. They change the color, and uh, they change uh, for uh, tables. They have um, a wooden surface, then they, they take off the wooden surface, and they took off a linoleum, then they took off the linoleum, and then they change it to painted black or painted red. And so you're really living with the objects. I I think so. There's a change in, like in, in architecture. Mm. Not as much, but there is. I, I, I think there's a, a, an interesting point here with um, living with things and things that are, that are in the custody of a museum. And um, I, I know that, that um, in contemporary art, we try to respect the intent of the artist. And often, now we have to ex respect the intent of the designer. And um, the solution that you found at your museum of, of you know, having something that is just falling apart, you can't do anything about it, sort of freezing it at a certain point, and, and being able to show that intent and that concept uh, and perpetuate that into the future um, while still retaining the original, I think is a really, a really good and interesting solution. And we'll probably see more of that um, in the future. So I think also we have, we have to inform the, the people that things are, are getting older, that design is not always new design, even if you look at Eames chairs or something, you see it everywhere, uh, even in new architecture. But uh, if you take an original Eames chair or a Panton chair from the 50s, from the, it looks different. And, and this is something like, I think it's, it's a kind of education uh, we, we as museums have to do with or have to deal with. And, uh, and I'll that, correct you, that, 
there is nothing like an original Panton chair uh, or original Eames chair because it's a design and design is always original. Yeah, but, but as Friederike told earlier, there, there are differences in the material or they the changed the productions at some point. And if I, if, if I don't see this, some, let's say if I have an, the first series of Panton chairs, yeah. first hundred pieces, they were made out of glass fiber reinforced yeah. polyester. So um, I want to see this and I knew, okay, this is from, from this series. And this makes difference for people who, 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 who know about this. Uh, and there is another aspect of question. We cannot see like people in the 19th century. There is a very, very great difference of reception of seeing the world. This is another aspect of what should we do in our museums. To speak and to say it's not absolute authentically. Uh, what belongs to the moment of reception. I think this is a good time to open it up to the floor for questions and people that want to um, ask some questions. Um, maybe if I can get a volunteer to, oh, we've got someone. So I'm just gonna call on people uh, right here on the second row. There's a microphone. And please tell us your name and maybe your affiliation if you're coming from the <laughs> Hello, I, I'm Dinah Eastop, and I'm a textile conservator by training, and I also have a PhD in material culture studies. And if I'd been in your position as chair, I wouldn't have started with the word materials. I would have started with the word matter, which in English means both the physical matter, the materiality, but also the, the um, what matters, what is significant. And I think conservation is always dealing with the material reality but also what matters about that material reality. And that's where the change takes place. And I think that's the complexity of what we're dealing with. And that's why this idea of um, you had the semantics and materiality is very important. The semantic and materials. And I think that's what you've been playing with. You've been playing with the material reality and the changes that happen over time, but different people's perceptions of that reality over time. And that, that's what conservation is always grappling with. I'm not criticizing, I'm just no, saying no, no, it's, it's complicated. Okay. It's on, it, I wrote it down. It's on my list, which I decided not to start there, but that's okay. Well, we great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> but you can come up and chair this. Would you like to? <laughs> I, got, I got talked into this very last minute. Um, another question. We actually have a question from the online chat room that's going on. Uh, this is from a student at the University of Amsterdam. I don't have a name, unfortunately. Um, however, uh, they're asking, how does Tomas want his beeswax object to be restored? Suppose the vase is torn or it is lost forever. Yeah. Well, there is an aspect of the originality of the object. Once it's made, it's, it's unique. You know, it, it, it will never be the same, um, therefore, if we have a damage to the object and I classify it as this, this piece, um, it is, we, we take pictures of it and if, if there's a damage to it, it's dead for me. So it's a complete loss. I have to make a new one. But we had, um, we had tried and we succeeded a couple times in placing these objects back into the hives and the bees restore it. And you, you won't, uh, yeah, it's true. And you, you won't even be able to see where the damage has been. It's, it's flawless, it's, it's a perfect repair machine. And in that sense, a perfect method for making an object. Uh, because if there is a damage to it, you just place it back and it just, it's perfect. But it's not 100% what it was before. There, it's, there, there's, there's a change because it's a natural process. It's not uh, mass production through a form or through a mold. And uh, for example, we're working now on, uh, we're designing a pavilion, a complete pavilion made by bees. So imagine a large architecture that you can walk into. And it's quite a, co well, quite a complex engineering project, but um, we're making out of tiles uh, of, of honeycombs. Uh, so they're replaceable. And we were asked, like, what happens if, if an audience, you know, through it being used in a, in a museum environment, it gets damaged? And that's one of the aspects that I agree with the fact that if a tile is damaged, you place it back in the beehive and it will be re restored and repaired and you put it back and 
there, nothing happened to the thing. And it can be continually, continuously renewed as, as an architectural experience. And I think it's, it's, there's a beautiful story in it that it's, it's not fixed and it can always live as a new thing. So that, I, don't, I hope I answered it. Um. Also, um, when you create one of these works, do you set the written parameters for if something was to happen, or do you have those dialogues? That question comes from me, Amber Kerr Allison. All right, well, what, what, what we do when we place a mold in a beehive, uh, I, I, I preset certain conditions uh, for the bees, and the bees build the object, and I have to intervene all the time to, it's like working with a bonsai. You always have to sort of just cut and shape it until it's, you think it's finished, uh, it, re it still resembles what the idea you had. It's never the same. And you pull it out. You pull it out from the process, and that, that's it. But I, but I was speaking to um, when someone acquires one of your works of art, oh, okay. do you set parameters with the institution or the yes, individual yes. as to what your expectations yeah. are regarding its, its conservation or, or no conservation? Well, MoMA was very good at it, that they ask everything like uh, the, the temperatures and, and you know, all that stuff. So that there is a range of temperatures in which it can be stored or, or displayed. Um, I don't think humidity plays any level to it, uh, which is great um, because it's wax and, um, and also UV light. Uh, so all these aspects uh, play. But, you know, with any, anything like that, UV light is, uh, is a problem, uh, any material. So. I will, um, I'd like to just tell a, a kind of a similar story about beeswax. We have a piece in our collection by Wolfgang Leib. I'm sure you know Wolfgang Leib's work. He's an artist who works with bees, uh, beeswax as well. And we have this room which the visitor is allowed to walk into. The problem is, is that because it's this wax is this beautiful material, everybody wants to touch it. People want to stick their fingernail in it and to see what it is. And it got damaged, so people were signing their name, they were like putting their initials, putting hearts, you can imagine. So we contacted the artist and we, we said, you know, we tried to restore it because it was really unforgiving. You know, we were trying to remelt that area and using spatulas and you would always see the area because the way he made these panels in the room, he would just cast them in a mold, take them out of the mold and then that's part of the room. But we would never get that same quality. And he was very unsatisfied as well as an artist. So what we did was we reproduced the damaged panels. And this, I wanted to bring this up also because Tim's talk about reproductions. You know, and here's another example. I know this is a, a fine artist's work, but I think we're talking about art, so it doesn't really matter. And I just want to see if there's anybody in the audience or online who wants to talk about reproduction. You know, I mean, with Thomas, he was saying, you know, it's a unique object that's very interesting, you know, and it's destroyed and it has to be remade. But there is this other side of a replacement part or a reproduction. And I want to see if anybody in the audience or the panel wants to comment further on that. Yes, please. Um, Sarah Staniforth from, from the National Trust in uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, I, 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 I was very struck by what Dinah said about, about, you know, we are not exclusively, but a mainly uh, Western uh, audience here. And we have a very specific view about material culture. Um, and I work with collections in historic houses and it's all about that balance between how objects are used and their materiality. Um, in um, the Far East, the, the culture of conservation is all about the meaning of objects. So a Japanese temple, for example, probably has not a single iota of material that was there when it was first made, yet it can be hundreds of years old, and the meaning of the temple is what is conserved rather than its materiality. And I, actually, I had a question for, for the panel, if it would be all right to, to ask it. And, you know, we have a tendency to make a distinction between what we call contemporary and um, the historic but I just see it as a, as a continuity. And you know, I wondered if me members of the panel do really see um, a distinction between works of art that are being created, or works of design that are being created now, and the things that have found their way 
into, into collections in museums. Anybody on the panel want to? Denise? Any? One division would be obviously the, um, whether the artist was still alive to have input. If, the, if something was damaged or something needed conservation, um, not necessarily if it's considered historic or contemporary, but uh, whether or not the artist can play a role in helping the conservator. And uh, on that same point, I'd be interested to know if you have the same experience as you did with Tom Dixon, where the artists are typically engaged and interested in the process, or? Um, he was very interested in, in our project, but, but as I um, have written in, in my lecture, um, we, we don't take the the, the, the the answer of the designer as a conservation concept, and it's the same in art. In the art world, you 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 are doing the interviews, but it's it's a help maybe for 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 the conservation uh, treatment. But for me, it's more or less a, a, a part of the documentation of the whole object. So to understand technology, the making of the production of the, of this object. And this could help in restoring or conserving the object. This could help very well. But um, it's often like that, that the designer is saying, OK, um, send it to me, and I rework it. And then we have a new version, let's say. And, and this is not the thing we, we, as a design museum, would like to have. So, so we try to keep it in this condition as it was. And we, we try to, to make it better readable if it's too full of traces of use, something like maybe for those who are on Friday who are still there, we have a lecture on, on a Corbusier kitchen and there we had lots of problems with traces of use, like 40, 50 years of use and changes, modifications in the kitchen and and the original uh, design was by uh, L'Atelier Le Corbusier, so, so we were really in a, a between two chairs uh, from the decision um, what to do. And um, yeah, as I told earlier, it's, it's always a question, um, what, what is a collection? We as a design museum have other interests as, as a technical museum and, uh, or an art museum. So it, it always takes influence in your decision lately if we, if we, we are honest. So um, yeah, I, did, I don't know if I answered your question or no, not at all. I was asking for an opinion rather than yeah, yeah. Other questions from the audience? We have one. Online, that's fine too. I, yeah, we have another one from online. Um, this question, hold on, let me scroll back up there. Uh, this question comes, hold on, uh, sorry. There's been a lot of chatter all of a sudden. Um, this question comes from Karen T. Brake from the Netherlands Cultural Heritage Agency and Inca coordinator. Uh, this is being posed to the conservators um, Regarding interviewing artists and designers, she states that it can be very difficult as you want to get information, but don't want to influence an artist's choice in, say, materials. And she's asking if you've ever experienced an artist changing a material um, based on your advice or asking you to change a material. And then she also secondarily wonders um, what kind of challenges you've had in interviewing artists. Mm, yeah, um, a lot of thoughts in my mind. Um, consulting artists or designers is not easy because we as the conservators um, should think about that we don't interrupt the creativity of the artist or designer. And um, in, in, in Cologne I did uh, quite some consulting artists and there was one artist who was working with polyurethane soft foam and he made little teddy bears and he wanted them to have them pink so he bought pink polyurethane soft foam and put them on exhibition and the people who know polyurethane soft foam uncoated in pink after two weeks they are yellow and, uh, but he liked pink and he came to me and says, don't you know any material we can use the same haptical that it's soft and feel like it? And I said, think about coating them, but then they feel different. 
um, and you can change the material to a poly, poly, um, polyethylene foam or a mixture of polyethylene and uh, polyethylene foam, but it feels different. So we tested some, some kind of, uh, of material and um, he tried it out and he was really unlucky and said, that, no, no, it doesn't work and he, don't, he doesn't want to, to coat it and uh, he said, so I, I don't do teddy bears anymore. <laughs> He changed to, uh, today he's working with polyethylene uh, foil or something like this. And another thing was an artist working also with beeswax and um, she's, she's creating objects working with found objects, found paper, found books. And she's cutting the books and dipping them in, in um, beeswax and then putting pictures on it and so on. And beeswax is really likes dust and on, on the exhibitions, and it's not a very famous uh, artist, and they have exhibition places which are not clean, like the MoMA or so on, yeah? So she, she has a lot of problems with dust, and I told her, so why don't you change the beeswax to a more mineral wax or so? So I really um, started a scientific test with her, because she's, she's really maniac, maniac and working really precise. So I ordered different waxes and um, developed a form for her and said, so try these different waxes. We did it, I don't know, this, it's, a, it's a form like this, you did 20 waxes and then you mix the waxes and so on. At the end, we found a wax which worked really well. It looked like beeswax, it's touched like beeswax. And I thought, okay, now we found the material uh, of the choice. And then she came and said, hey, you know, I think I go back to beeswax. I like the smell so much. <laughs> so it was, it was just the smell. And I said, oh, why did I do all, all this work? But it was fine, it was really a great experience, but uh, consulting is really difficult and you have to be really sensible to work with the people. It's really dangerous to, to bring them away from their work. Yeah? So it's always, I try to be really careful um, to work with them. And sometimes it works really good. You can talk to them if, it, if the work is in a decision process. Yeah? And with designer and industrial design, there's the chance, like the BASF, the industrial company in Germany, they uh, develop the material, yeah, the material laboratory. It's the design factory. They invite designers to come to the factory and uh, they did discuss the design and they say, uh, the designer say, I want to have these and these and these habits of the material. And then the plastics engineer says, okay, you can use this material, but then you have to change the design. So the engineer and the designer is developing the mass produced object then. And this works with some designers and some not. So there is no general conclusion you can see, uh, draw. <laughs> Any of the other conservators? Denise, do you want to add to any of that or have a comment on that? Um, well, in, in researching this particular yes. sort of thing, um, I found that, that the, the designers and artists, you know, um, uh, do, are concerned with materials. And, um, and, they, and they, they try to understand their particular material extremely well. Now, as far as longevity and what kind of plastic it is, I think most of them think that it's plastic, it's going to last thousands of years because it's plastic, you know, and it's never going to die. Um, but they are, um, they are sometimes really uh, interested in knowing the best adhesive, the best coating, um, and, and, um, and do that own their own research on that, so, you know. Um, and I, I think I'll just say a little bit um, from my experience at MoMA. I haven't had much experience with uh, designers, but with, um, with artists, yes. You know, uh, Matthew Barney, Bob Gober. Uh, some of these artists do consult conservators uh, about their materials. Now, this came later in their art practice, and much later when they're already collected in major museums, I think that's when they start to to be more concerned. And um, we had this experience with Matthew Barney where we had a very early work in our collection um, when he was still a student. And he made this piece with um, 
using the ice packs. Um, there's a paper on this if people want to see it that was given at a conference in London on plastics, but um, it's a piece called Stadium, and I think the title of the paper is Stadium, and my co-author is here, so maybe Margaret, Margaret can tell me. But, um, and it was really interesting because the, he made these ice packs for this frame out of just traditional ice packs you buy in the grocery store that, that you know, that you put on an injury. And they degraded, and they degraded the plastic, which was a PVC, and it was he that noticed when we had this piece installed that he no longer felt that it represented his original intent of the object. And so therefore he um, wrote to the museum and said, send it to me and I'll fix it. And we were like, well, wait a minute. We don't send our objects back to the artist to be the conservator. And it's interesting because you have done this with your vases or you've repaired before. And, um, but we wouldn't do that, we would work. So we worked with the artists and what we ended up doing was remaking these ice packs. So we made a reproduction, but with the authority of Matthew. But our big question was then what, what are, once it was finished and he approved it and he really loved it, we said, but what is this? Is this you, is this me? What's the date of this work? You know, and this is where it becomes this sort of very fuzzy area. And in the end, you know, he said to us, he's like, no, that's the real thing. You know? I find that a lot of, a lot of artists, like, and the, the, it's their idea that matters more right, than right. Who, who laid hands on it, who made it. Right. You know, and that's what they want to perpetuate. And I found that it's true, the older artists get and the more famous they get, you know, however cavalier they've been in their early career. They get serious about about their materials as they sure. as they they are more collected and more you know um, and you know, so. questions. Uh, Stephanie Stephanie Winkelbauer from the University of Applied Arts here in Vienna. I'd be interested to know what experience uh, members of the panel have had dealing with industry when it comes to proprietary mixtures, adhesives plastics when you would like to get some idea of what the uh, recipe was uh, to deal with later possible degradation or um, breakage because this is, uh, can be a problem if people are hanging on to their industrial secrets. Um, that's, that's quite difficult to get information from the industry, that's, that's clear for sure. Um, so we, we try to, to make our own tests, material tests, or we send them to scientists for, for analysis. And um, we try to do conventional tests, adhesive tests, um, if it comes to problems like tears or cracks or something. Um, sometimes you get information, f for example, um, for, for, for uh, um, research on RP techniques, on rapid prototyping techniques. I went to a, to a factory who produces uh, these objects and they were very open-minded in communicating what they are doing and where are some problems with the material, but for them it's not so, so difficult. Also, uh, they say, okay, we, we, it's, it's okay if it lasts two years or two months, something like this, but, but then it's gone and we have a different point of view that's clear. Um, but they were very open-minded, um, so it always depends, but the bigger the company gets, uh, the, diff the more difficult it, it becomes. So, yeah. Sometimes it's like uh, the last uh, chair from Konstantin Kritschic, he made together with, with uh, BASF, they, they really published a book on the production of this chair, um, so they, they become aware of, of of the, the interesting fact that uh, how it's how it's made like, but if you if you look at it from from our point of view, even these publications are not not uh, good enough for, for for information. There are some steps that are in in there, but it's yeah. With uh, an industrial company, uh, we were working for a gallery in in Paris on a, on a piece uh, they commissioned me to do. And it was uh, some, a monolithic object made from wood, and it was painted with uh, with big ink, and it's the ink from the notoriously known disposable big pen BIC. And um, it's, it's it's a very beautiful ink, and I, um, I think Jan Fabre is very well known for using it a lot in his artwork. 
and I also try to uh, work with it a lot. And uh, so we, we made this object and uh, we painted it with this big ink and it was just stunningly beautiful. And we had it lacquered with, uh, f it's called uh, French polish, which is an old technique of layers of, uh, um, of lacquer. Um, but we found out it, it doesn't stick, it doesn't stick well. And so I, I called a big company um, in, in France and we're, they have the headquarters in France, and they were just impossible to get through. We and and we, we stated openly, we're we're doing a limited edition art object. We need your information to make it. I mean, using phrases such as "we're going to help," "we're going to do free advertising for you," in the sense that we're using the material uh, and you're making something unique with it, except making pens. Um, and it's a beautiful, visual, stunning uh, experience. So uh, we wanted to get the, the data on the, the content of the ink. What is, what is it, the molecules? What, what are we using? And we couldn't get a single, single element of this ink. It was, it was an um, intellectual property. So. I got very angry because I, I don't like to waste time on such, such hassle because it had to go through, you know, someone had to ask somebody else and they said no, so I tried different links. So then I said, okay, uh, I'm gonna analyze it myself. So I went to this big company, big with a B-I-G, not big, <laughs> big company in Netherlands who specializes in chemistry and I do chemical analysis. And we just gave them a job, like, here is a sample of an ink, tell me what's in it, so I can find a lacquer that I can use to, to, to paint over it. Uh, so that's how we got around. But it's, 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 a, it's a sad story that we have to go around to find it ourselves, what could have been given us for free. I would even sign a contract saying, I will never tell anyone, but we need it to get an advice on a lacquer, for example. To create a new piece, to create something new for the new generation, we need an old information. And sometimes it's very difficult. It's also that um, the, the material produced by the industry, they change the recipes sometimes every week, sometimes every three months, sometimes every year. So you can't be sure you get the same material you ordered last year. This is um, mostly the problems with, with plastics materials. So, uh, like, like Thomas said, it's uh, one part to, to do the analyzing, and uh, there are a lot of chemists uh, around who can, who can do the analyzing the material, but this is one point. The other point is really to do your own test, like, like Tim said. And then with these results, you can go back to the industry and say, here, listen, I know that this is this is this in it. So, what did you change? Can you tell me more? And sometimes then you can get, you can get some more information. Or you, um, at the, um, as we do it with the, with the plastics, um, the University of Plastics Engineering, they're working together with the plastics industry and they get more information than we do. It depends who is asking the industry also. So you have to look for whom you're working with. Then, sometimes you find some more information on it. We have some other questions in the audience. Yes, in the back. No, right here in the front. You could go ahead, please. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martina Grise, University of Applied Arts, Vienna. Um, one comment and one question. Um, we have uh, invited Frederike Wendig already several times to have lectures for, at the University of Applied Arts. And we also invited our artists, young artist students, to take part in the lectures. And I have to uh, say that uh, two of them came afterwards and changed their um, material choice, um, especially with the epoxy resin uh, sculpture. And uh, one question, um, I'm not a specialist in modern and contemporary art conservation, but um, going back to the, the, to the wax conservation question, uh, some of 
some of you have been to the Josephinum today, the wax, anatomical wax collection from the 18th century. And um, there's a question uh, in my mind, is there really a difference in the conservation of a wax model from the 18th century and a wax object, for example, from uh, you? I mean, if actually we would uh, use the same methods and the same materials to do a proper conservation. I mean, the difference is that you are fortunately are still alive and we could discuss with you. But, um, or even you manage to train bees yeah, to do the fillings. But um, um, especially in wax, I see no big difference. Plastics is different for sure, but sometimes I'm very sad that the uh, conservators who work with modern and contemporary materials are, are not really linked with the conservators who work on historic objects. The, um, a closeness between artists and contemporary conservators is, um, yeah, it's bigger than to the other conservators. Yeah. I'm just going to comment freely because uh, that, that's something that I felt for a long time. Uh, that um, we live in the era where um, where we specialize a lot uh, as individuals in things that um, you know need further and further uh, investigation. So we become experts in in very miniature sense. Uh, but I, you know, in, in in back in the back in the days uh, when when things were made by artisans. They were, in a sense, chemists and, uh, and, and craftsmen and also conceptual thinkers in, in one. And I sort of like the idea of, of sort of the Renaissance man where he masters the technique, he masters the material, uh, not only the technique of painting, but let's say the technique of preparing the paint. He knows the matter he's working with. It's very rare to find uh, contemporary artists who know a lot about what they work with. They, they just you, they just buy buy a can in a in a in an art shop and, and just paint with it. Um, I'm, I'm sort of the, the old school where I want to know what I work with. What is it made of? What's the history of the material? Uh, where has it been used? When I when I work with paper, I wanted to know everything from the history of art. Who made what with paper? I wouldn't start working with it knowing that somebody else did something like that already. And that was the same with wax. I know everyone who did something with beeswax of a certain relevance. So, so I don't do something twice, and I learn from it. So th there is an aspect of approaching things as a, as a sort of this holistic view on, on what you do, where you, you are a restorator in your own means, that you know a lot about the process, um, because you want to know everything about it. It's not just the concept itself. And uh, I think that's, that's what we're missing right now, where we're in the era where we are just individuals. Uh, I mean, you, I don't know how many of you are restorators, but this is a conservation society, so I suppose a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, that uh, that in, in the days where there were no restorators, the, the artists themselves were the technicians uh, as, as well, taking care of their own works, making sure it lasts for a very, very long time, because most of the time there were commissions, uh, such as uh, industrial object is today, a painting was uh, in the past. It was, there, there was a mecenage, uh, someone who wanted it as an object in his house, it, has to last, it had to last forever, and uh, it qualified as, 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 uh, as, uh, as an industrial object for me. I feel that, that there, there was no difference between a painting, a public sculpture, and a, a staircase, or, or a building. It w was a piece that was made with all the seriousness uh, of, of putting something out there that, has, that will be there for, for the rest of the history to watch. So um, I don't know if I made my point, but I just want to say that we are sort of now very, very focused on one thing. Uh, and, and we're losing the, the bigger scope. So you, you have to take care of the faults of the artists and you have to, you have to m let it survive for the other generations. Thank you for that. <clears throat> That's a nice kind of conclusion here, I think, because um, 
Um, we do have one more question that I think somebody's very an anxious. I'll take the one last question uh, and Hopefully then we'll wrap up. Hopefully this will be a good question to end on too. Uh, I'm Rob Payton, I'm from the Museum of London. What happens to the dead body? How is it buried? <laughs> um, that's really interesting. Um, when I was a student at the Royal College of Art, I wrote a paper called Two Pooped Out Pop Chairs because I came upon a PVC blow up chair and a uh, Le Sac, which is like the, the beanbag chair uh, that was made of a polyurethane. And we considered these dead objects. And I wrote in this small paper, do we build coffins for them to put in storage? Um, it's a very good question. I think uh, at the Museum of Modern Art, we had an object that was no longer exhibitable and we threw it away. So, you know, it depends on the institution. You know, I, 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 it's a really good question. I mean, it's something that, but I do think it's something we have to accept. I think it's something that um, some of these objects are not going to be around forever. And um, we then document. And uh, I think there's other examples in uh, works by Nam Gabo, who are uh, early plastic works that have been lost in collections. Um, so, you know, but they are, their legacy continues through documentation. And that also shows the importance for our job as conservators and of documenting and keeping that information. Um, thank you everybody for your comments. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for coming and for giving their um, really nice uh, presentations. And thank you all that came here to hear us speak. I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry Padani, who's the president of IIC to just wrap it up. Please join us in the reception, and we uh, do hope you enjoyed it. Go to the IIC website, look for the transcription in the video, and check out the other uh, roundtable transcriptions. Good night, and thank you very much. <laughs>